KDW 5. I was incredibly naive and I believed what I was told. Married into an extremist cause. But are they innocent victims or willing participants? There ain't no other solution. Either take them home or leave them in these camps. W5. The journey from Canada to this place involved hard choices. With a special investigation into the fate of Canadian ISIS brides pleading to return to their home country. I just had no idea how much I could miss my own country. Who were lured by love, but claiming they were enslaved by terror. In the beginning, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And... Push, push on him! Push! We mean him! The unending push to be the best. It's every day, it's all day. To stand out and stay on top. It's all about how big you can be, how popular I can be. But becoming a champion comes with a price. You have to nurture that, and nurture it costs money. Rick Westhead explores the busy lives of young elite athletes. How big a part of your life is soccer? I do it almost every single day. The training, technology, and sheer determination. Well, he's never wanted to take a day off. And the drive to reach their goal. I love the game. I love playing it. Here is Kevin Newman. Hello, and thanks for joining us. They are citizens without a country, and the countries they once lived in don't want them back. The reasons are obvious. They left to join ISIS in Syria and Iraq as jihadi fighters or their wives. Now, because of their radicalization, Western governments have been reluctant to take them from the prisons and refugee camps they now live in. But as CTV's Paul Workman discovered from inside Syria, there are now some women claiming they didn't know what they were signing up for, and they're pleading for the chance to come home. Not so long ago, this journey would have been foolhardy. Into the heartland of ISIS, to the caliphate, a place synonymous the world over with torture, beheadings, terror. Those hills, Syria. Suros, Syria there. Here in northern Iraq, a glimpse of what lies over the border in Syria. Our destination is a vast refugee camp, festering with 40,000 displaced victims of war, but not just victims. Through oil-rich land that fueled and financed the most powerful jihadi force ever assembled. Seemingly out of nowhere, the fighters of ISIS swept their way into Iraq and Syria, capturing oil fields and refineries, seizing the weapons and ammunition of a deserting army. And where, in the ancient city of Mosul, creation of a caliphate was declared. Muslim men from around the world rushed to defend it, and then it all collapsed. After five hours on the road, across land now controlled by Kurdish-led forces, the first sight of Al Hol refugee camp is disturbing. Most of the people here are Syrian, forced into this homeless misery as the hunt for ISIS reached their farms and villages. But there is a secret wing of this camp you can't see, where the wives and children of ISIS fighters are kept behind locked gates, maybe 1,500 altogether. People from around the globe, from nearly 50 countries, including Canada, known collectively as the Brides of ISIS. The journey from Canada to this place involved hard choices and consequences that perhaps the women never considered. Beyond the promise of living a religious life in the caliphate, there was the deprivation, the oppression, and eventually the danger that went with it. I wish I could turn back time. <laughs> I mean, I look back now and think I needed help. I don't think I was in any situation to really be making any rational decisions. It's just sometimes things happen. Kimberly Pullman grew up in a Christian home in Vancouver. She raised three children, and then something happened. In 2004, she converted to Islam. 
A decade later, she met a man online. He proposed marriage and persuaded her to come to Syria, where she could put her nursing training to good use. I was lured here. I was told to come where you're loved, come where people need you, where your skills are desperately needed. I was incredibly naive, and I, I believed what I was told. She says she did work in a hospital for a time. I had some skills as a nursing student. Helping to treat newborns and young children. But violence was always near. Running from the relentless bombing, hiding in one besieged town after another. I don't know how to describe a bombing to somebody who hasn't been in it, but it's terrifying. And the noise, I mean, your head's ringing, your ears are ringing, and there's glass everywhere, and people are screaming on the streets, and they're screaming everywhere. The bombings become so intensive that you can't stay. So you're forced to move to wherever you can move to to try to, to, try to live. We got stuck in Ghanaian at one point for several months. We couldn't get over. We couldn't even get back over to, to the rest of this. It was a disaster. Um, I remember that there was no food checks. There was no medical. There was an incredible amount of bombings and gases and phosphorus and everything. Um, sorry, I haven't been in touch too much. Um, I'm just still pretty weak. All along, she kept in touch with her sister back in British Columbia, mostly through text messages. It was a pretty scary time. She was always scared. W5 agreed to hide her identity because Kimberly's decision to join ISIS has made her family a target. I can't even pretend to understand my sister. She's always had a very different reality than, um, than the rest of us. I know her very well. Um, you can never know a person entirely, but she's never been a violent person. She's, she's, she acts in a humanitarian role helping people. She would never want to cause harm to people. I think that she should come back um, and face any consequences that she has, just like anyone else. If, if she's broken the law, then um, for sure. You have English speakers associated. Kimberly hopes desperately that Canadians will understand and forgive. What I know of Canadians is that they're a very loving, very accepting people for the most part. Um, but I would hope that they would be willing to accept me back as, as a Canadian who was born and raised my whole life there. My mom was like, I'm trying to get out, I can't get out. Amy wants the same to the point of despair, but not regret. She grew up in Alberta, married her boyfriend, a Jordanian-Canadian, and followed him to Syria with their two children. We have to be, like, um, obedient to your husband, so... And that's what you do. How hard was it? Yeah, it was really hard, because I don't know the language, I don't know the culture, and it's completely... It's completely new. It's a completely new society, you know? And just had to deal with it. Curious about the bombing, constant day and night? Yeah, or? day and night, non-stop bombings. In the beginning, it's terrifying. Especially at night, you, they, there were these bombs, they would hit the floor and it felt like the earth was shaking. And me and the children, we were sleeping in a tent outside. How did your boys get on? The boys, to be honest, they're by my side all the time. I'd never sent them to school. I never sent them to like a, a play date or any of these things. I've always had them by my side. I'm just, I've always been like that kind of mom, just keeping them close, especially, you know, here. I don't know what's gonna happen. She says when they first arrived, her husband barely yeah, talked about what he did. I didn't ask him like so much. He didn't like to talk about it, to be honest. He didn't really like to talk about it. But she admits he became an ISIS fighter. And that's how he was killed. So you married again? So I had to marry again. Like you go to a place and you put your name and you put every, like your credentials and what you, what you want in a husband. And they find like a suitable match for you. Where was he from and where is he now? He was from Bosnia and we were only married for about 
maybe three months, and then he got killed. Now she's carrying her second husband's child. She's 34 years old, twice a widow, and still devoted to Islam after all that's happened. I love being a Muslim. I love being a Muslim. It, I feel like it keeps me grounded. I don't I have no problem with Islam. But you have great regrets about leaving Canada? It's hard, but I, you know, like, I can't say I regret it because I like, the, the child in my stomach, I don't regret it, you know? I think I should be allowed to go home. I didn't, I don't believe I did anything wrong. I didn't kill nobody. I didn't do any harm to anybody. I just, I was just with my kids. The real problem with talking about the women and children of the Islamic State is that this is conflating two very separate issues. Jessica Davis is a former analyst with CSIS, Canada's intelligence service, and the author of Women in Modern Terrorism. She believes Kimberly, Amy, and the others need to be returned to Canada, but treated carefully. Most of the women that traveled to join the Islamic State knew full well what they were doing. It was a listed terrorist organization at the time that they went, or if it wasn't, it was very close to being so. Their atrocities were well documented. They knew what they were getting into. That's not to say that they didn't make some bad choices, do bad choices constitute a crime? Quite possibly. It is inconceivable the women were blind to what was going on. Once they're home, they absolutely need to be investigated and ideally prosecuted. All of them committed a crime by traveling to join a terrorist organization. The children, of course, need to be treated separately because they are innocent in this situation. They were either brought to Syria or Iraq by their parents or were born there. But Canada, it seems, does not want them back. Not a single Canadian diplomat has been to the camp. And Kurdish officials say a plan to bring the women home was suddenly dropped several months ago by Ottawa. <laughs> Abdul Karim Omar is the province's foreign affairs minister. We had communications with the Canadian government and we met in our office in northern Iraq. We agreed on handing over all Canadian citizens back to Canada whether they were fighters or women and children. They even sent us passport applications, which were completed and sent back. But the process was suddenly stopped, and we don't know why. Global Affairs issued this statement to W5. Reports of an agreement with the Kurds are false. Given the security situation on the ground, the government of Canada's ability to provide consular assistance in any part of Syria is extremely limited. And yet, W5 had little trouble gaining access to the camp. It must be mad now because the number of new people there. Human rights lawyer Cliff Stafford Smith is incensed by Canada's behavior. I've always thought Canadians were the good guys, the nice guys, right? Um, and I'm very, very disappointed in uh, Mr. Trudeau and his government that they're not doing what is obviously the right thing. What's going to happen to these people who were there? What are the dangers they face? There ain't no other solution other than either to take them home or to leave them in these camps where people are going to die. We know of 36 children who have died of malnutrition and hypothermia in the last few weeks. The desperation is obvious. Locked in a rough outdoor prison, cut off from the world, begging for the right to go home, yes. and a long way yes. from getting there. I want to be with my family. I want my kids to go to school, <coughs> get a proper education. I wish that I hadn't gotten caught up in a world of lies and secrets and fear. I just had no idea how much I could miss my own country. While they may want to come home, Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale has said repatriating the brides of ISIS is, quote, not a priority.